All right, welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about converting a context-free grammar into a normal form uh, called Chomsky normal form. So often when we're working with a uh, context-free grammar, uh, it will be convenient for us to have it in a normal form. What this means is there are uh, typically many different grammars that you might be able to come up with for uh, your language that you're working on. And because there are so many different kinds, it, and, and it might be hard to tell if two grammars are the same, or it might be hard to work with a grammar in the form that it's in, it can be convenient for what, whatever purpose it is that we're using these grammars to have them in some form that we can be confident that, that it's consistent in some way. And we usually call these a normal form. Now, the normal form that we're going to be looking at is going to be uh, one developed by this gentleman here, Noam Chomsky, who is a very prolific researcher in a number of different fields. Uh, he contributed to linguistics, um, and that's sort of where this comes out of. Um, and, but he also has done work in uh, computing fields as well. Um, and so this is, again, I'll just highlight, this is just one kind of normal form for uh, context-free grammars. There could be other kinds of normal form, but this is just the kind that we're going to study here today. So the rules for a Chomsky normal form, if we're going to have a grammar that's in this form, it has to have certain uh, structure for its rules. And specifically, it only permits two kinds of rules. And we can see these rules uh, here. Uh, we've got um, the first rule here says that any rule that has sort of a variable on variables on the right hand side has to have only two variables. So B, C, that's the only way we're going to allow it. There's not allowed to have three. There's not allowed to have single rules. Then when you have a terminal, so sigma here is just being a terminal, uh, and it appears on the right-hand side, it can, this is the only way the rule can be a rule, uh, a variable replaced by a single terminal. So we're going to have to update whatever our rules are so that they have these forms. Okay, And part of the idea of a normal form is guaranteeing that every uh, context-free grammar can be converted into this form. So even though our, gr our grammar might not start out in this form, we should be confident that we should be able to put it into this form uh, as needed. Um, there are a couple extra special parts to the Chomsky normal form that also are important. Um, when a rule appears on the right-hand side here, it cannot be the start variable. That's important. Some of our grammars, we do have the start variable appearing on the right-hand side, and so we're going to have to update our our uh, rules so that's not the case and then finally um, we do have to allow there to be epsilon rules in our uh, grammar because if epsilon is part of our language we need to at least have this rule the start symbol going to epsilon but um, in Chomsky normal form this is the only rule that can have epsilon and it is the start rule going to epsilon so if epsilon's in our language then we definitely know we're going to need this rule but other than that we're going to eliminate all other epsilon rules so these are these are the conditions that a grammar must be in to be in Chomsky normal form how do we get our grammar into Chomsky normal form is a different question this, this is just a way to determine if a grammar is in Chomsky normal form or not so let's start with an example grammar here, and we're going to try and convert this one into Chomsky normal form so that we can explore a, the procedure that you would use if you wanted to convert an arbitrary grammar into Chomsky normal form. So let's take a look at what that's going to look like. There are going to be five steps that we're going to need to perform. And we're going to start by addressing that start variable uh, business that we mentioned, which is that we need a new start variable uh, for our uh, new grammar uh, so that we can ensure that it doesn't appear on the right hand side. In case our old start variable does appear on the right hand side, uh, we can get away with it by creating a new one that doesn't. So all we're going to do is make a new rule s0 goes to s where s was the old start variable. So in our grammar here, we do have s appearing on the right hand side of some of our rules. That's not allowed. Um, so then we're just going to create this new rule here. And when we do that, now that S, o, S sub naught or F sub zero here, this is going to be our uh, start variable now. Now it doesn't appear on the right hand side and it simply just leads us into the old grammar as it was before. This also introduces a rule that's not allowed, but we're going we're gonna to fix that rule here in a bit. 
Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try and get rid of what we call epsilon rules. So remember, one of our rules said the only time that epsilon can show up on the right-hand side is from the start variable. So if we have any other rules that are of this form, we need to get rid of them. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's imagine we have some, uh, we've got one rule here, A goes to epsilon. And then we've got any other rule, B goes to something with A in it. Okay, that's all that matters here. Here it looks like there's a U and a V and those might be terminals, but no, U and V are strings of variables and terminals. This could be anything on the left, anything on the right. All we're saying here is the rule on the right-hand side has A in it. Okay, well what we're going to do is since we have the rule A goes to epsilon, we know we can get rid of that A if we want. We could have B goes to UV and that's exactly what we're going to say here. We're going to take the string as it were if we deleted the A and make that a new rule. Say B can just go to that without uh, having the A in there, basically preemptively substituting the A with the epsilon and that will create a new rule that doesn't have the epsilon. If we do that for every occurrence of A, on the right hand side of rules, then we don't need the rule A goes to epsilon anymore and we can eliminate it. And that's our next step. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. So here we have an example of B goes to epsilon. And what we're going to do here is we're also going to notice, hey, we have here A goes to B. So we could replace that B with an epsilon and that gives us this rule here, A goes to epsilon. Okay, we also had this rule up here, S goes to uh, a, B. Well, again, we can replace that B with an epsilon, so we're going to create a new rule here, S goes to A. Okay, and we did that for all occurrences of B on the right-hand side. There were only two, so we're done. What we'll notice is in this step, we've actually created a new epsilon rule. So this is a recursive thing that we do. After we apply it once, we might get more, so we apply it again and again and again. We keep applying it until there are no longer any epsilon rules, or there's only one and it's the start variable. So let's apply it again. So now we have uh, our rule here, A goes to epsilon is the rule that we want to eliminate. And again, we're gonna look for occurrences of A on the right-hand side, and we see it's in this rule here for S. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and replace it a couple different ways. I'm gonna replace it uh, one occurrence uh, the right-hand occurrence here to get this rule, the left-hand occurrence to get this rule, and I'm actually going to replace it twice just to show that if it occurs twice there, we might actually want to eliminate both of those, in which case we get this strange rule here, S goes to S. Um, and I'll just note at this point, this isn't part of the conversion procedure necessarily, but we know that this rule is redundant. It's never going to help you do anything. And so I've just gone ahead and manually eliminated it at this point saying, okay, this rule is silly. So I've taken it out. Okay, so continuing, we're now going to have, uh, we, we now want to eliminate rules that only have one variable on the right hand side. Okay, so remember our rule when we have variables on the right hand side is it can only and exactly be two variables on the right hand side. So that means we need to eliminate ones that have less than two, in this case one, and we also have to eliminate ones that have more than two, which we'll get to in a moment. So right now we're going to deal with these, we call these unit rules because we're replacing one variable with another. And that's sort of a substitution that's redundant in some cases. So what we're going to do instead in this case is we're just going to say, hey, if A can just be replaced with B, why don't we just take all the rules that B have? So if B goes to U as a rule where U is any string of variables, again, like above, it'll be any string of variables and terminals. We'll just take that rule and make it A goes to that rule instead. So we can sort of take out the middleman of B here in this case. So let's take a look at this. We do have this rule A goes to B. So what we can do here is we can go find what B goes to, in this case, B goes to lowercase b, and we can just say A goes to lowercase b, and that's what we've done up here. And now we don't need the A goes to B rule anymore. We also have the A goes to S rule here, and S goes to a whole bunch of stuff. And we should copy all that stuff down. And that's what I've done here. I've just copied that whole rule down and added it to the A rule so that I can eliminate this unit rule. We notice that we have one more of these, and that's the uh, one we created at the beginning. I sort of highlighted that at the beginning. Hey, we've introduced a rule that shouldn't be here, so let's uh, now fix that. 
and we're doing the same thing s goes to s so we're copying that same batch of rules up above here and we see we get uh, a lot of what kind of look like redundant rules here okay now we're we've got most of the rules uh, almost into the form that we want but there are a couple that are important here is uh, on the right hand side in Chomsky normal form we can only either have a single terminal or two variables and we had a couple rules that had mixed that had some terminals and some variables so now what we do in any of the rules that have some variables and some terminals is we want to replace the terminals with variables and so what we're going to do is create special variables as needed like this one here where for some terminal sigma we're going to create a rule b sub sigma that just goes to sigma and that way we can replace any of the sigmas that appeared on the right hand side with b sub sigma so in particular here, we already had one rule here, B goes to B. And I'm going to leave that alone and just use that as my rule. Um, if there were any occurrences of B on the right-hand side in rules that were in mixed cases, I would use this uh, uppercase B to replace them. However, the only occurrence of lowercase B on the right is this one, and it's already in the right form, so we don't need to do anything to it. The ones we do need to change are these A, B ones, because they're mixed. And so what we have done here is we've created a new variable that just goes to a i've called it a sub a because we already had an a and i've just gone and replaced all those lowercase a's there with this a sub a variable which we know now can be replaced with a so again our grammar is unchanged after this manipulation okay our final case is well what about rules that have more than two variables on the right hand side now at this point on the right hand side all we're going to have are variables or a single terminal so that part's good but we might have two or more variables on the right hand side so we're going to go find all the cases where the number of variables on the right hand side are more than two and we're going to start splitting them up into smaller rules and we're just going to be doing that by breaking off so we're you know it depends on how you want to do this but you can sort of break off um, everything except for the first one and then you can make that into a new variable and and therefore you can take that rule that's what we've done here so we've said imagine you take off ev all of these symbols u2 up to uk and you make them into their own new rule and then we can replace this rule no matter how long it was with just this new one a goes to u1b so we just take the first variable and b now it's in the right form b might still be in the wrong form but then we can recursively apply this as we've done before. So let's try this here. We've only got these rules here, these ASA rules here. Now we're going to follow the rule as we did there. I'm going to make a new rule that goes to SA. I called it S sub A. It goes to SA. Now we can replace all these SAs with just that rule, SA. Now we have S sub A, I should say. And now these are of length two. And S sub A already, just by luck, was also of length 2. If we had a, had a longer one, we might have to recursively apply this here. But now we're, we're done. Um, and we've followed the uh, five steps of converting a grammar to Chomsky normal form. And just to look again, on the left-hand side, we have our uh, original grammar. And on the right-hand side, we have our resulting grammar after the conversion. And we can see it's a lot you know, for our purposes as human beings, this left-hand grammar is probably better, but this is usually used in formal cases. Maybe we're writing a proof about it. Maybe we are uh, computing with the grammar in some way, and this makes it easier to compute with. So this is less, this formal Chomsky normal form is less useful in an abstract sense for humans, but more useful in a formal sense, in a mathematical context or a computing context. And that's why we wanted to look at that. All right, that's all I wanted to look at in this video. So thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you in the next video.